Okay, so hi, and welcome to the Hawaii Big Meeting. And so today we have a rather special guest lecture, which is by Larry Shin, and he will be going over uh, a US a strategy, preparation and a strategies for USA Co bronze. Okay, hi. Oh. Uh, hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about some musical bronze topics that um, are commonly used in musical bronze and are like very important to know, not just for bronze, but also um, after you pass bronze into silver and gold, these topics are all really, really important and uh, you should know them very well. So the first topic that we're going to talk about is time complexity. Um, does everyone know, here know what time complexity is, or um, should we go over briefly um, what to basically what it is? Um, okay, uh, I guess we'll just briefly go over what time complexity is and do some practice, I guess. So. What is time complexity? Well, time complexity is just a measure of the number of operations that it takes for your program to run. So for example, if you had a program that was just inputting A and B and outputting A plus B, your program wouldn't have to take a long time. It would only have to take around one or two operations for it to finish. However, if you have a more complicated program with for loops, while loops, other recursion or whatever, then you need to have a good a sense of your time complexity just so that you can make sure that your program will run in time and that it won't um, time out or that at least it gets the test cases you were hoping that it gets. Um, does anyone know how many operations that it takes for um, or how many operations you're allowed to have on Usico in a normal problem where you get like two seconds for C++, four seconds for Java? Does anyone know? Um, well, this is an important number to keep track of. So you should know that there are five times 10 to the eight operations allowed on Usico. On Code Forces, this could be different. Um, on different websites, they have different servers. So if you go to a new website, you should always check what their, um, how many hertz it is, because uh, that's basically how many operations that you can um, do. However, on Usico, you're allowed around five times 10 to the eight operations, depending on your constant factor. So um, even though you're allowed to have five times 10 to the eight, eight operations, you should only aim for around 10 to the eight operations. This is because you want to make sure that your program will work, even if it has a bad constant factor. If you aim for five times 10 to the eight, then if you have a bad constant factor and there's no way to improve your constant factor, then your program's just going to fail and you're, you're not going to have anything to do about it. So th this is why you need to aim for around 10 to the 8, preferably as low as you can get it. Um, and the most important part about this is you always want to calculate your time complexity of all of your solutions before you code it. This is for many, many reasons. But this is to make sure that your program would work and you wouldn't waste any time in your contest. Like, let's say you think of a solution and you're like, oh, this is so efficient. It's definitely going to work. But then after you code it, you realize, oh, hey, the time complexity is too large and it doesn't actually work. And it times out on everything except for the sample. Then you've basically wasted all of that time that coding that bad solution where you could have been thinking of a new solution so that you could actually get all of the test cases rather than get stuck on a bad solution. Another reason is to help you get subtasks. And subtasks are on Usico. They've started doing this recently, but at the bottom of the, uh, of the problem, you'll see some constraints where it says like test cases one to five um, satisfy n is less than or equal to 5,000 or something like that. And um, if you can see how many test cases your program would get, it would help you get closer to promotion. And it would basically guarantee that you would get as, at least a certain amount of test cases. Um, yeah, does that make sense to everyone? 
So if this is time complexity, if it's so important, how do you actually calculate? How do you say what your time complexity is? And how do you determine how many operations that it takes? Well, we use something called big O notation. Does anyone know what big O notation is? Um, well, okay, so big, yeah, so what is big O notation? Oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, basically, it's a measure of the magnitude of the number of operations that it takes for your code to run. And um, it's written in terms of O of something. And um, basically, you don't want to include any lower degree terms or constant factors. What do I mean by constant factor or lower degree term? Well, look at this, O of 5n plus 1, 2, 3, 4. That wouldn't really be a time complexity. That wouldn't, um, that would just reduce down to O of n because you see that there's a 5 in the time complexity. Uh, there's a 5 constant factor. And there's also a, a lower degree term, which is 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you get rid of the constant factor and the lower degree terms, then it would reduce down to O of n. Another example of getting rid of lower degree terms is, for example, if you have O of n squared plus n, that would just reduce down to O of n squared. That makes sense to everyone, right? However, lower degree terms do not apply to different variables. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, consider O of n squared plus m. You will not be able to reduce the m down because even though n is to the 2 and m is to the 1, m is a different variable. What does that mean? Well, if I have n and m, I would have to have both of these, I, have, I would have to have knowledge of both of these time limits to determine which whether it would work. If m were 10 to the 9, then no matter what, my program would not work, even if n was as small as 20. However, if n was 10 to the 5, it doesn't matter how low m is, your program would still not work. So depending on the number of variables in your problem and depending on how much you have to do all of your coding and stuff, um, you would have to keep all of the terms as long as all the terms have different variables. So, yeah. Another key uh, note about time complexity is that this is worst case time complexity. If someone says the time complexity of their code is X, then the worst case, that, that means that the worst case time complexity of their code is X. Unless they said the average case time complexity or the best case time complexity of your code is X. Um, well, what does that mean? For example, the time complexity of quicksort is O of n squared. That means that the worst case time complexity of quicksort is O of n squared. In the worst possible test case for your program to run, quicksort will run in O of n squared, even though on average it runs in O of n log n. And so this is a very important uh, note that you have to consider when you're doing uh, big O notation and time complexity. So um, how do you calculate time complexity? Well, calculating time complexity is actually um, fairly hard, but there are often many ways to go down uh, or many ways to calculate time complexity in a very simple way. The most common way to do this is just memorize a bunch of common patterns. And these common patterns don't have to be very complicated. It's just like, for example, a single for loop from one to n that would of course be O of N. But knowing that it's O of N can really help you save a lot of time just scanning through your code and looking at, oh, this is N, this is M, 
these cancel and whatever. Another common uh, pattern is if you have nested for loops, each for loop would multiply in your time complexity. So for example, a for loop one to n nested within a for loop from one to m would just be O of n times O of m, which would be O of n m. And another way to easily calculate time complexity is from memorizing algorithms. But uh, since bronze doesn't really have any algorithms that you really need to multi uh, memorize in order to you know, solve, really you just need to memorize the most basic ones. These don't really apply to bronze, like binary search is a basic silver algorithm. But uh, once you get into the more advanced um, algorithms, you really need to memorize all of the time complexity of all of your algorithms just to make sure that you know what the time complexity of your code is. Um, so now that you guys understand how to calculate time complexity, let's play a game. The game is called, what is the time complexity? Um, in the game, I'll give you a code and you will uh, basically give me the time complexity of the code. Um, yeah, are you guys ready? Okay, this is the first code. Um, uh, direct message me your time complexity and then, um, yeah. Um, oh, oh, wait, what just happened? Okay. Um, yeah, that's correct. This is in constant time because none of our operations are for loops. You're going from, uh, you're going with one operation in each line, but even though there are five operation or five lines and five operations, that's O of one because you don't care about the constant factor. So that was a nice, easy one for warm up. How about this one? Okay, seems like all of you guys have gone this one. So indeed it is n squared. So the first uh, two for loops, it might look a bit tricky, but the first for loop is just O of n. I goes from one to n and it's just O of n. However, in the second one, it's a bit tricky because it's going decreasing. However, if you go decreasing, it's essentially the same as going increasing because when you go from n to i, you're basically also going from I to N. It's the same number of operations. Well, how many operations is that? Well, for each I, you're going through N minus I operations. So when you sum N minus I over all of I, then you get N times N plus one over two, which is N squared. So that's the first two for loops. For the second for loop, it would be um, just O of N because i goes from 1 to n. So our total time complexity would just be O of n squared. That makes sense to everyone? Okay, our last one is here. Um, yeah. Okay, all of you guys got this one correct. So um, some people might look at this and say, oh, hey, this might actually run under n squared because 
uh actually black isn't the best color but because it starts from or starts from i and then this one starts from j so um if we try to think about how many operations this will um, take well one easy way is to try to find a bijection well um, if we find a bijection from i j k well um, if we say if we say if we look at the um, code, we can easily tell that I, oh no, uh, we can tell that I is less than or equal to J, less than or equal to K at all times, right? And once we know that I is less than or equal to J is less than or equal to K at all times, that means that it just corresponds to if we just do the entire N cubed and then just divide it out all of the times where i is greater than j or j is greater than k essentially we're finding n cubed except we need to order i j and k so it's n cubed over six but remember we don't keep our time uh, we don't keep the six in our time complexity because it's a constant factor so actually it would just be n cubed that makes sense to everyone since everyone got it correct so um yeah we can move on to our first actual coding topic um oh cnt plus plus is just a uh cnt plus plus is just a way to oh god i don't know what's happening cnt plus plus is just a way to um increment like basically add one to cnt so um if you do cnt plus plus it'll add one to cnt and the reason why i want to do that right now is um Actually, at the end, if you output CNT, that'll give you an approximation of how many operations that your program takes. So, yeah, that's why we put in the code. But, um, yeah. So, our next topic is going to be simulation. So, well, simulation is essentially simulation. You're given a problem, and it's basically asking you to simulate what happens after the process occurs. So the problem is asking you to uh, solve for something after a process occurs, and it describes the process in a lot of detail. And the easiest way to solve this kind of problem is just to simulate exactly what happens. So you, every time, keep track of everything that happens, and then at the end, you just need to output the answer. So um yeah these problems are generally the easiest and all it asks of you is just to code the process that the problem is describing so if you're given a problem that is asking for a process the first thing that should come to mind is okay can i do this problem with simulation can i simulate this process and get the answer and the way you can figure out whether you can simulate it and get the answer is to calculate the time complexity. If you calculate the time complexity and then your time complexity works, you don't need to think anymore. You can just code your simulation and then it'll work. However, many problems, not many bronze problems, but many silver, gold, or platinum problems can require you to have a better solution than simulation. So you could think of a simulation solution, but that wouldn't work. And you would need to have some more observations, some more fancy algorithms to actually solve the problem. So, yeah, does that make sense to everyone? Um, okay, if it makes sense to everyone, um, then let's get into some problems. So um, here's the problem. Um, I guess I can send it in chat as well. Read the problem and then just like say any observations you have or any ideas you have about the problem. Um, yeah. Uh, wait. Oh no. Uh, what happened? Uh. Oh. Okay. Uh. Oh. 
uh, yeah, I'm trying to send the link in chat right now. Uh, okay, there's the link. Um, yeah. Um, just try to send any ideas you have about the potential solution to this problem. This problem is one of the easier versions of simulation where you don't really have to think too far hard about the problem to figure it out. But um, anyways, you guys should try to give it a go to try to see if you guys can solve it. Does anyone have any ideas about this solution besides um, Xue Song? Do you have any like ideas about how you would approach this problem? Just from like, Think about why this is in a simulation lecture. Well, 
Hmm. I'm not sure what you mean by making variables for each shell. Um, but um, I guess if that means like you're keeping track of where Pebble is and um, uh, where is he? Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, uh yeah sure i guess you could do that and then um and then okay so um Um, okay, so almost all of you got this question pretty close. Uh, yeah, that looks correct. Yeah, that looks correct. So basically, the basic idea behind this is that you only have three possible, um, you only have three possible places for the shell to initially be at. So if there are only three possible places for the shell to initially be at, then you can just calculate um, wherever the shell is. So like you fix where the shell is initially at, and then after you fix that, you can just calculate LC's score because at every point in time, you know from the previous position where your new shell will be or where your new pebble will be. So, um, uh, so um, you just um, go through each, um, I mean, each swap, you going, going through each swap, you can check if Elsie's guess is correct after each swap. And then because there are O of one initial positions and there are O of n guesses, the total complexity is O of n. So you can do this in very very low time because n is less than 100 so yeah um does that make sense mostly so you start by fixing the initial positions you fix each oh. you fix each possible initial position and then after each initial position you can calculate how many else how many of elsie's guesses are correct and you can just calculate the maximum of all of those. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, uh, are there any other questions about this problem? Uh, okay, if not, then we can go to the next problem. Um, okay. Uh, um, okay. okay. 
I sent the problem in chat. So uh, take a few minutes to think about it and then we'll uh, talk about the potential solution. This problem is much harder than the previous problem. So yeah. So do you guys have any ideas about this problem? Like, um, Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the hard part about this problem is to determine how to reverse a shuffle, how to figure out, uh, basically how to figure out if I can go to this with one shuffle, then how do I go from this back to the original position? So let's do just a tiny bit of math. So if we go from, uh, so for one, let's say our initial permutation is one, three, two. Well, okay, so if we go from uh, one, two, three, or actually, yeah, let's say if we go from one, two, three, and we use this, well, what do we get? Well, one goes to one. Uh, that's not a good place to write. Uh, okay. Uh, let's say our permutation is, actually, let's change our permutation. Let's say our permutation is three, one, two, and our initial our initial thing is one, two, three. So what would happen? Well, the cow at, uh, the cow at position one will go to three. The cow at position two um, will go to one. And the cow at position three will go to two. Wait, what did I do? Oh, this should be a one. Uh, So our array would look like this. And so essentially what we can do is instead of, uh, in, instead of just trying to figure out what the initial position is and then check if it works, like guess and check, what we can do is we can notice that if I goes to AI, A of I, then it will go back to I when you reverse the permutation. So AI will go back to I 
after you reverse the permutation. So if you reverse the whole thing, that means that for each AI, it'll go back to I. So we can just calculate a reverse permutation. It's if, um, it's basically if, if, if I, or if a permit or if a permutation you don't know goes to it, then what is that permutation that you don't know? And we can say that's B of I. Well, now we know how to calculate B of I, right? Because we know that A of I goes to I. So we know that B of A of I equals I. So we can just do this for every I. And because we know A of I is a permutation, we know that this won't collide. So we know that um, all of the B of I will get initialized. And um, after we do this, we can just execute B of I three times and um, we would just be done. So um, yeah, essentially the key idea behind this is to figure out a way to unshuffle the permutation rather than trying to Basically, you're trying to unshuffle the permutation rather than trying to just guess the initial permutation and shuffle it and check if it works. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, the solution is here. Again, we want to calculate the time complexity. However, this should be relatively simple because in order to figure out B of I, we need O of N because for each I, we initialize B of A of I equals to I. And then uh, again, we need O of N to simulate the process because we have to do the process three times, which is O of one. And then we also have to, uh, we also have to do, it take, we also have to do n operations each process because we need to figure out where each one will go so that's o of three times n which is o of n so o of n plus o of n would be o of n which runs in time does that make sense to everyone okay if it makes sense then let's move on to our next topic which is complete search so complete search is also known as brute force. And it's one of the other easiest ways to just solve a bronze problem. And again, um, complete search is often when you have to find an optimal answer. And if you find an optimal answer, the easiest way is just, well, what are all the possible answers? If we can generate all the possible answers and then find which one is the optimal one, then we can find the answer. And that's complete search or brute force in a nutshell, where you just generate all of the possible answers and then you just check which one is the best one and then you're done. However, even though this might be one of the easier algorithms, you again need to make sure that it runs in time uh, because you want to analyze the complexity. Like you want to see whether your program will fail a lot of a lot of the time, the complete search solution is so easy to figure out that they think that you need a few observations before you can um, completely utilize complete search to find the answer. Because with complete search, um, your algorithm might be too slow. You might have to generate too many unnecessary answers and you not, might not be able to output the optimal one. So uh, you want to make sure uh, you want to make sure to analyze the time complexity of your solution to make sure it runs in time. With these two algorithms in particular, just because it's so basic and um, it's one of the easier things to implement and easier things to think of, um, you always want to, especially with these algorithms, check the time complexity because um, you want to make sure that your code works. And the best way to do that is to just check the time complexity. So yeah um okay if we have no more questions then uh let's do the first problem
Uh, wait, okay. Hmm, wait, what does the sample say? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. so for the sample, um, it takes at most uh, four because you can only take all the ones from one to four. So that would be four diamonds. You can't take six, so. Um, you can't take all five diamonds because your maximum difference is three. So if your difference is at most, um, if your difference is at most three and six minus one, uh, because six minus one is five, which is bigger than three, you want the difference to be less than or equal to three because K is three. Oh, it wants like the numbers to be different by at most three. Like six minus one has to be at most three in order for six and one to be both included. Yeah, 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 that's correct. So each diamond can only be K bigger than every other diamond. Yeah. Um, um, But what if, okay. Um, okay, so it seems like all of you have come to some sort of progress or at least 
uh, solution in some way. So um, yeah, essentially the idea is you want to fix your minimum or maximum diamond. And once you fix the minimum or maximum diamond, you can then just figure out all the diamonds that you can include for that given minimum or maximum diamond. And then after that, you can just figure out, well, once I've included all of those diamonds, then I can just figure out, well, what is the maximum possible amount of diamonds that I include if, um, if my minimum is that? And then after that, you can just take the maximum over all the possible minimum diamonds, if that makes any sense. So um, we would, uh, so my solution was a bit different, but it essentially uses the same concept where once you fix the minimum diamond, you can figure out how many diamonds are between that minimum and that minimum plus K. And once you've figured that out, you can just find the maximum over all n, all n things. So you have n diamonds to consider, and n um, you have, and you also have n diamonds above it to uh, to add. So you have O of n squared. Um, if that makes any sense. Another solution would be to sort the array first. And once you sort the array, you realize that the answer has to be within a range. And then you can just iterate through the entire range to see whether it works. Um, yeah, that's another way to solve the problem. But yeah, um, I assume we have not many questions because everyone basically solved the problem. So let's move on to the next one.
Um, okay, do you guys have any ideas about this problem? Or anything that, or any progress that you've made about this problem? Um, yeah, so, um, uh, so you can fight, you can basically for this problem, you can just try to fire every single lifeguard. So you fire one lifeguard, how many, how many hours can you still get? If you fire the next, the other lifeguard, how many, or I think it was seconds, but how many seconds can you get? So essentially you want to, you want to figure out what the maximum number of life or what the maximum that what the minimum number of um, seconds that you can remove by firing a single lifeguard so um, the idea is you have a bunch of lifeguards and um, you want to figure out um, which one is the one that if you fire it, you get rid of the least amount of time? Um, well, okay. In this scenario, it's just zero, but let's, okay, actually, let's get rid of this one. Okay, so now you realize that, okay, so if I remove this middle one, then I get rid of this amount of time. If I remove this one, I get rid of this amount of time. If I remove this one, I get rid of this amount of time. So if I do all of that, then I can just easily calculate, well, if I have this many, um, or if I have, okay, so if I fire this lifeguard, this middle lifeguard, then how much time is here? Well, there's a lot of ways to calculate that. But, um, uh, wait. yeah, there's a lot of ways to calculate that. But essentially, the essentially the easiest way, I guess, would just be to iterate through each of these ranges. And for each of them, you can check whether the lifeguard is there or not. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just you go through them. You don't have to think too hard about these types of problems. Um, like, usually, if you can't solve a problem like this, it's usually because you're thinking too hard about it. So often, if you're stuck on a bronze problem that is similar to this kind of problem, where n is really small and the range is really small, then you can just take a step back and think about, oh, wait, maybe I don't have to think about it that hard. What if I just go through every possible situation and find what the maximum possible answer is? And that's one of the easiest ways to just solve bronze problems, where especially if you realize that the limits are very, very small, you can just easily solve the problem without much hassle. So... Yeah, you can just go through each lifeguard um, and yeah, that would just work. Uh, okay, um, yeah, so here's the solution that I wrote. Um, basically, you have N lifeguards to fire and then if you fire each of them individually, calculate the total amount of time to fire, uh, that you get. There are many ways to calculate the total number of time. You can go through each of the other possible lifeguards, or you can store it in an array over all of the positions, and then you can look at whether the positions 
have other lifeguards in them. If they don't, then you add to the amount that you need to remove. And so it depends. Um, it could be O of N or it could be O of um, X. But anyways, it's around O of N squared or O of N squared or O of N X. So yeah, both solutions will easily pass in time. Because if you think about it, N is only 100, X is only 1000. So yeah, it'll easily pass in time. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, okay, if it makes sense, then uh, uh, we can just uh, talk about some additional practice problems. So um, if you guys have any questions about these, um, you can, of course, ask me in a private chat, and then I'll try to answer you as soon as I can. And then if you have any questions about the problems that we've done before this, you can also ask me in chat. And yeah, so in the next one and a half hours, um, you will have time to just try to do these problems. Um, yeah. So... Here is the problem. Um, I assume you guys have read it already. So um, yeah, let's just go into the basic of the solution. So the idea behind the problem is that you have a bunch of cows and their points, and then here, and then here, then here. And every time the cow will go in a direction, let's say like this and like this. And um, you want to figure out, you want to figure out, uh, you essentially want to figure out how many or how, how long it takes for the cow to stop. So, the easy way, if you look at this diagram, the easy way to figure that out is you go for each cow to figure out whether it stops in the first place. You can figure out, well, from all of the cows left of the cow, the ones that are going to the right, um, do they get to the point before this point does? And for each pair of cows, for this cow, for each of the other cows here, you can basically figure out how much time it takes for this cow to reach the intersection of those two lines and for that other cow to reach the intersection. And so for example, here, let's say this takes two time, this takes seven time. So because this takes two time and this takes seven time, this will eat um, seven, or this will eat like seven or um, eat seven units of grass, I guess. Um, and the first cow will only eat, uh, will um, go all the way through because it gets to the intersection point first. So if it gets to the intersection point second, then you find the maxima or the minimum of all of those numbers. And that's basically your solution. Although uh, there are special cases, actually, wait. Yeah, there are special cases where you have like um, something going here, something going here, something going here, and then you have something going here, where once this one cuts this one off, then um, None of these two get none of these two get affected by this one anymore. And the way you can deal with this kind of case is where um, uh, the way you can deal with this kind of case is kind of like you can basically say, well, instead of this being an entire line, now this becomes just a segment. So now this just becomes a segment and um, 
And uh, yeah, you can just do it from there. So um, if this gets cut off, so, so basically you can just simulate until this one gets cut off. And then once it gets cut off, then you can just, yeah, you can use the interval to do it. So yeah, might be a bit confusing, but essentially, essentially you change the ray going to infinity and once you figure out what the minimum time is you change it into a segment and then after you have a segment of that then you can basically use that segment to figure out your solution um if that makes sense are there any questions about this problem um okay if not then I guess we can end the meeting here.